through the Bible to understand the connected big picture, full story that God is telling us through his word and our part in that story. And we've come to the point where Israel now has human kings. One of those kings, Solomon, as we saw last week, had a divided heart. Partially given to God, partially given to a host of other things. And Solomon's divided heart led to God's discipline. Uh, it leads, if you continue on there, in 1 Kings 11, it leads to several uh, fights with foreign enemies. But ultimately, the divine promise that Solomon's son would lose his kingship to one of Solomon's own subordinates, a man named Jeroboam. And when Solomon learns that God has chosen Jeroboam to be the next king of Israel, he, like Saul, a former king, tries to have him killed, but is unsuccessful. And Jeroboam flees to seek sanctuary in, in the country of Egypt. Eventually, Solomon dies and his son Rehoboam takes the throne. But as we're going to see here in our time together in God's word, it doesn't last. The kingdom of Israel fractures and God's people are divided. What happens when God's people divide? What, what, what are some of the causes? What are some of the outcomes? Well, that's a multifaceted answer. But we're going to look at some of the parts to that answer today in 1 Kings chapter 12. And as we go through God's word, we're going to see God's people divide with bad counsel. God's people divide to their own hurt, and God's people divide to follow idols. If you have a Bible with you, or if you, if you want, you can grab one there in the church pew. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 12. And I realize it's a longer passage, but we're going to read that entire passage here this morning. Rehoboam, Solomon's son, went to Shechem, for all the Israelites had gone there to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he was still in Egypt, well, where he had fled from King Solomon, he returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Rehoboam answered, go away for three days and then come back to me. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam con consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. They replied, if you today will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young men who had grown up with him replied, tell these people who have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Tell them your little finger is thicker than your father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam. As the king had said, come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young men and said, my father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord to fulfill what the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through Ahijah the Shebanite. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, O Israel, look after your own house, O David. So the Israelites went home, but as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. King Rehoboam set out Adoniram, who was in charge of forced labor, but all Israel stoned him to death. King Rehoboam, however, managed to get into his chariot and escape to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. When all the Israelites heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over Israel. 
Only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the house of David. When Rehoboam arrived in Jerusalem, he mustered the whole house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 fighting men to make war against the house of Israel, to the, excuse me, and to the region for uh, Rehoboam, I'm sorry, and to regain, excuse me, the kingdom of Rehoboam, son of Solomon. But this word of God came to Shemaiah, the son of God, or the man of God. Say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, to the whole house of Judah and, and Benjamin and to the rest of the people, this is what the Lord says. Do not go up to fight against your brothers, the Israelites. Go home, every one of you, for this is my doing. So they obeyed the word of the Lord and went home again as the Lord had ordered. Then Jeroboam fortified Shechem in the hill country in a frame and lived there. From there, he went out and built up Peniel. Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to Rehoboam. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan, and this thing became a sin. The people went even as far as Dan to worship the one there. Jeroboam built shrines on high places and appointed priests from all sorts of people, even though they were not Levites. He instituted a festival on the 15th day of the eighth month, like the festival held in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. This he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves he had made. And at Bethel, he also installed priests at the high places he had made. On the 15th day of the eighth month, a month of his own choosing, he offered sacrifices on the altar he had built at Bethel. So he instituted the festival for the Israelites and went up to the altar to make offerings. What is going on when God's people divide? Why do they do it? What, what, what's, what's some of the fallout from that? Well, the first truth we're going to look at is that God's people can divide with bad counsel. And we see that specifically in verses 1 through 17. I'm not going to reread them, but let's just turn our attention to those real, real briefly. Solomon's dead, and his son Rehoboam and the people of Israel, they, they come there to Shechem to have a coronation, to make Rehoboam king. And news travels fast, even in this ancient society, without the use of social media or telephones or email, news travels fast, and it reaches Jeroboam's ears down in Egypt that there's a new king in town. There's a new king over Israel. And so while he's there living in asylum in Egypt, he decides now's the time to come back and see, but what if maybe we can make amends with Israel's new leader? And so Jeroboam comes back and he joins his countrymen, likely a, a group of Israeli dignitaries that formed kind of a delegation. And they, they come here together. They come to Rehoboam with an offer. And they speak pretty plainly to Rehoboam. They say, in essence, hey, listen, your dad was hard on us. But if you'll lighten up a little bit, we will be faithful citizens. We will be faithful subjects. We will be loyal to you. Rehoboam listens to this delegation and he sends them away for three days while he considers their offer. And he asks his father's advisors, his, his staff, his former cabinet, if you will, he asks them for advice and they say to him, you know, hey, if you give on this issue, you're going to have loyal people following you. And then he asks his buddies, because why not, right? I grew up with these guys. They're my pals. He asks them, what do you think I should do? And they say, turn up the heat. Tell him, man, you thought it was hard with my dad and the words of BTO, you ain't seen nothing yet. Okay. I, I put that part in there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
And there in verse 15, we see, you know, just as God hardened Pharaoh's heart when Moses and Aaron told him to release Israel from captivity, God has hardened the ears of Rehoboam. And he does not listen to the counsel of the elders. And by Rehoboam's failure to listen, God fulfills the word that he spoke through one of his prophets. And there in verses 16 through 17, Israel hears Rehoboam's response and, and they effectively secede. They say, hey, what, what share do we have in you? Hey, that's a rhetorical question. As, we, as we've seen in God's word, anytime there's a rhetorical question being asked, look out. What share do we have with you? Clearly, none. So good luck. We're out. We're out. But just as God promised David, just as he promised Solomon, kingship did not totally depart from Rehoboam. The line of Judah remains faithful to him. You know, famous passage in the church, in the New Testament, you know, 2 Timothy 3 tells us all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What do we take away from these 17 verses? Well, the fact is there's probably a lot that we could take away. But in the interest of letting you go home someday, let's just focus on a few things. Friends, it's, it's not enough to just seek counsel, okay? We have to seek the right counsel. Because, listen very clearly, not all counsel is equal in value. Now, Rehoboam did seek counsel from the aged and from the experienced, and then he sought the counsel of his peers. And what was the result? He rejected good counsel, and he accepted bad Job, one of the few people who says things more or less correctly in the book of Job, says in Job 12, he says, Is not wisdom found among the aged? Does not long life bring understanding? Peter tells the church in his, in his first letter to the church, he says, In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Really? Yes, really. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Clearly, you know, Rehoboam should have listened to the elders and, and, and not to his friends, but there is still a far greater counselor Rehoboam should have sought, and there is no record of him seeking him anywhere, and that is the Lord. David. His own grandfather says this in Psalm 16. He says, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, as my heart instructs me, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. In Psalm 119, it says this. It says, your statutes, speaking to God, it says, your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have preserved my life. Save me, for I am yours. I have sought out your precepts. The wicked are waiting to destroy me, but I will ponder your statues. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. Not all counsel is equal in value. Some of it's good and some of it's bad. A veteran of the Spanish Civil War, Juan Pujol Garcia, came to absolutely loathe totalitarianism, both in Francisco Franco as well as Adolf Hitler. So when Britain went to war with Germany in 1939, Garcia was determined to do his part. And he offered the British government to work as a spy for them, but with no credentials and no real known background, the British government turned him down. 
but he was determined and he wasn't going to be let being told no stop him from trying to bring down this fascist government. So he got in touch with the Nazis and he pretended to be a, a Spanish official who was constantly traveling back and forth to England and he offered to spy on England for the Nazis and they jumped at the chance. They jumped at the chance. For the next few years, Garcia sent Germany all these false reports, using a lot of factual information and then just slipping in some critical fabrication where it was advantageous. He even led the Germans to believe that he was the head of a 27-man spy ring with full names and full backgrounds. But these 27 men existed nowhere except for Garcia's own brilliant imagination. In time, MI5 began to recognize the incredible spy work that Garcia was doing. They brought him into their network of spies. And they actually nicknamed him Agent Garbo because he was so good at just making stuff up. Now, his greatest act of deception actually came before the Allied invasion of Europe. D-Day, something we just remembered here a few days ago. And they see the Nazis had accurately estimated when and where the Allies were going to plan their, their invasion. The spying was going on so much between these two sides, it was hard to keep a lid on information. So what do you do when all that information's leaking out? Well, you put out some bad information. Garcia convinced the Nazis that this planned attack was indeed real, but it was just a feint. It was just a ruse. The real attack was going to occur miles north on the French coast. He was so convincing with this lie that on D-Day, actually, when Germans were calling for reinforcements, Hitler forbid it, saying, no, this is just a faint attack. We're going to wait for the real one. Well, of course, there was none. And the Oz were able to establish a beachhead and eventually win victory over that continent. Friends, it's not the problem that, that Germany failed to seek counsel. They did. They sought it in earnest. The problem is, it was really bad counsel. Hey, if you are a leader among God's people, if you're an elder, if you're a deacon, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a ministry coordinator, if you're a parent, yes, if you're a parent, you're a leader. Friends, we need to understand this. The counsel that we follow directly impacts those that are serving under us or alongside us. And the counsel we follow has a direct impact on the health and the unity of the family. <clears throat> Proverbs makes it very, very clear that seeking counsel is a good and noble endeavor. But we need to remember, not all counsel is good counsel. If we are going to seek human counsel, hey, I'm just going to encourage us to do this. Let's not seek it from our peers, but from those who have actually been where we are going and have come out the other side of it, still glorifying and honoring God. Let's seek counsel from godly men and godly women. Because to be honest with you, try as they might, your peers usually don't have any more information or insight or wisdom than you do. Better still, better still. Let's seek counsel from the counselor of counselors, and that is God himself, through his word and through prayer. The second truth we're going to examine here today is that God's people divide to their own hurt. And we see that in verses 18 through 25. Rehoboam evidently really didn't take that declaration of secession very seriously. He sends out his uh, secretary of forced labor, if you will, at an Iram to go out and to conscript the Israelites into forced labor. And they kill him. They kill him. And judging by the text there, it appears that they intended to kill Rehoboam as well, but he, he escapes and he flees to Jerusalem. And the writer of Kings there in verse 19 reveals how to the date of this book's composition, Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David. 
There in verse 20, Israel turns to Jeroboam instead, the man who had once rebelled against Solomon, and they decide to make him king over Israel. And only Judah remains faithful to Rehoboam. There in verse 21, Rehoboam is outraged by the rebellion, and he musters all of Judah's fighting force to go and to win his kingship back. But there in verses 22 through 24, before a full-scale civil war can emerge, God stops it by his word. God tells Rehoboam, he tells Judah, he tells everyone assembled there, don't go and kill your brothers. This has happened because I've willed it to happen. And fortunately, God's people actually listen and obey the word that God gave to them there that day. Jeroboam, however, it appears to me in verse 25 has next to no trust that Judah won't come and attack at some point in the future. He immediately sets about fortifying the towns in his area. First in Shechem and then in Peniel. Just as God's word called his people not to, not to harm one another then, Friends, God's word calls us not to harm one another now. In Galatians 5, powerful, powerful letter, Paul, under the, the, the leading of the Holy Spirit, writes to the church in Galatia this. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by one another. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify, gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other. So you, you, you are not to do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft. Good, good. It still feels good at this point, right? You know, well, I'm not struggling with that. But the acts of the flesh continue. Hatred, discord, Jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. <laughs> Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Emo Phillips is a, is a weird and strange comedian. That's my assessment, okay? He's a weird and strange comedian from the 80s, and, and I, I can't tell you he's any friend of the church, okay? However, his most popular religious joke, I think within it, has a critique of the church that is probably worth considering. It goes like this. Once I saw this guy on a bridge and he was about to jump and I said, don't do it. Don't do it. He said, nobody loves me. I said, God loves you. Do you believe in God? And he said, yes. I said, are you, are you a Christian or a Jew? And he said, a Christian. I said, me too. I said, what denomination? He said, Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too. Northern conservative Baptist or Northern liberal Baptist? <laughs> he said, Northern conservative Baptist. I said, me too. Northern conservative Baptist Great Lakes region or Northern conservative Baptist Eastern region? 
He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council 1912. He said Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council 1912. And I said, die, heretic, and I pushed him over the edge. Friends, Paul tells the church in Corinth, he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, and another, I, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Cephas, and still another, I follow Christ. Later on, he says this, what, what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, uh, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Friends, we divide ourselves with names like Calvinist, Lutheran, Arminian, Mennonite, Friends, th these are the names of mere men. Why would we give, why, why, why would we assign ourselves that kind of a name when we can have a far greater name, and in fact do have a far greater name, the name of Christian? Hey, listen, okay? There are times to break fellowship. I'm not going to tell you there's not, okay? Because there are. And if you need an example of that, a biblical example of that, turn to 1 Corinthians 5, okay? 1 Corinthians 5, specifically verse 11. That being said, I think oftentimes we divide ourselves over personal preferences and not actually biblical principles. <laughs> Friends, Israel had real enemies to contend with. At that point in time, it was primarily Assyria. That's a real enemy. But instead of gearing up and arming themselves to fight against a real enemy, they're gearing up and arming themselves to fight with one another. If you don't know this, good day to know it. The church has real enemies. And God's word makes it very clear we do not fight as the world fights. But we have enemies nonetheless, primarily the world, the flesh, and the satanic realm. Very real, very much against the people of God. Friends, let's not be gearing up and arming up to fight with one another, but gearing up, arming up to contend with real enemies. The final truth we're going to look at here is that God's people divide to follow idols. And we see that in verses 26 through 33. <laughs> you know, despite being made king of Israel by 10 out of the 12 tribes, because Benjamin went with Judah as well, that's a pretty good ratio. 10 out of 12? You should feel pretty secure, right? <laughs> Jeroboam's afraid. He's actually terrified at the prospect of God's people reuniting. Now, can you just stop and think about that for a second? How sad is that? Boy, I sure hope God's people don't get back together. That'd be terrible for me. And yet that's what he's afraid of. And rather than risk losing his kingship, possibly his life, he's not going to risk God's people coming back together. So he decides probably the best course of action is for God's people to worship idols instead. You'll note there that Jeroboam also, like Rehoboam, listens to some pretty bad advice. And note how he couches this proposal as concern for the Israelites. You know, it's just too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. It's just too much for you to actually do what God is telling you and telling me to do. What's the solution? Oh, I've got it. 
we're going to construct not one, but two golden calves, which he places at the southern and the northern parts of his kingdom. And Jeroboam leads his people in sinning against God. And in 31 through 33, he doesn't just stop with golden calves as if that wasn't bad enough. He builds shrines on hilltops, just like Israel's pagan neighbors. And he institutes his own priesthood, making people priests who ought not to be priests. Because if you look back in the Pentateuch, you'll see that God had commanded that it was the tribe of Levi that would serve as Israel's priests. And Jeroboam's just making whoever he wants. And he can't even come up with his own authentic paganism. He has to try to copycat real worship of God. He establishes his own sacred days, which he not God has selected. And he makes sacrifices not to God, but to these idols that he's made. Now, if this sounds a little familiar to you, it should, because it is. There's another time when Israel fractured itself to worship idols. And it's in Exodus 32. Moses has gone up to receive the law from God, the law to govern and instruct and guide and to protect his people. But when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, Moses' brother, and they said, come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they had handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then he said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. This is almost a direct reenactment, only it's not a reenactment, it's the real thing. It's a sad, it's a sad reality. And trust me, this has been a very difficult sermon to prepare because it's about as much fun to preach as I'm sure it is to listen to. It's a sad reality, friends, that God's people have a repeated history of dividing themselves in order to go follow after idols. Again, Paul tells the church in Galatia, he says, formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not God's. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You're observing special days and and months and seasons and years. I fear for you. I fear for you. John, at the end of his first letter to the church, after all of this great and deep and profound theology, caps his letter like this, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. You know, when we think of idols, at least this is true for me, when we think of idols, when we read about idol worship in the Bible, we tend to think of statues, okay, or or little figures that maybe you carry around in your pocket, okay. But you know, the lure of idolatry, the call, the siren's call of idolatry, it is a lot more subtle than that. It's far more subtle than our simplistic preconceived notions. Because the fact of the matter is is that idolatry can embed itself in just about anything. Pastor Justin Buzzard, he he uses the following assessment tool for his church to help determine if there's an idol lurking in our heart. And he just picks on four specific idols that he, over the course of his ministry, has seen to be common idols that God's people tend to struggle with. The first one is control, the idol of control. He says, you know you have a control idol if your greatest nightmare is uncertainty. Frankly, judging by the text, I think that's Jeroboam's real idol. He might have a golden calf, but I I think that's probably Jeroboam's idol. You know you have a control idol if your greatest nightmare is uncertainty, approval. You know you have an approval idol if your greatest nightmare is rejection. Comfort, you know, you have a comfort idol if your greatest nightmare is stress or demands. Power. You know, you have a power idol if your greatest nightmare is humiliation or embarrassment. Friends, as as I stated earlier, and we do see it 
periodically throughout the New Testament. There are times that God's people need to break fellowship with others who are going the wrong way. But friends, there's, there's a very deep soul-searching question we must prayerfully and scripturally ask ourselves before we do that. And that is, are we dividing in order to more faithfully obey God or are we dividing in order to more faithfully obey our, our preferred idol? Now, you might be wondering, you've been wondering this whole sermon, and I thank you for keeping your wondering to yourself, okay? But you might have been wondering this whole sermon. You know, Trev, why are you highlighting the dangers of God's people dividing when God's the one who orchestrated this division? Trev, if you would have just gone back a chapter prior, you would have seen that. And then also, you didn't even have to do that. Look right there in verse 12, or excuse me, in 12 verse 15. God orchestrated this. Well, that's true. That's true. God did orchestrate this division. God has orchestrated this division of his people, but not forever. Not forever. About three centuries later, God would speak through another prophet. A prophet named Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel 37, we, God, we see God promising to reunite this covenant people. Friends, we need to understand that this division was discipline, not prescription. Discipline, not prescription. Furthermore, that was the Old Testament. That was an old covenant. Trev, we got a new testament. We've got a new covenant. Yes, we do. And you know what? We know what God's heart is for his church today. And that's a big C church because God tells us in John 17, that all of them may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Friends, the counsel we follow directly impacts those under our care, under our leadership, and it impacts the health of the church. Not all counsel is good counsel. Let's seek counsel from qualified counselors, and by that I mean mature. That might mean physical, oftentimes does, but it definitely means mature spiritually, God-honoring men and women who have wisdom, and more importantly, let's seek counsel from the counselor, God himself through his word and through prayer. Friends, the church like Israel has very real enemies. Hey, let's not gear up to duke it out with each other. Let's gear up to fight the real enemies without. There are times that we need to break fellowship. God's word does make that clear. There's, there, there are such times. But let's make sure if we think we are approaching such a time that we are doing that to obey God. Not an idol that we really like and maybe even love. If you're not yet living a new life in Christ, this probably hasn't been that hard of a sermon to hear because you're thinking, you know what? Yeah, the church, you're all terrible. <laughs> it's probably been a pretty easy sermon to hear. This has been a hard one for the church. It's a hard one for me. But if you're not yet living a new life in Christ, I'll put this to you. You know, even the unsaved introvert knows that there is a very real need for connection, for community, for relationship. I see it everywhere in the world. And, and you know, this wasn't in my notes, so a little bit of a risk. I have seen it, especially in this part of the country, this deep, profound need for a relationship. And I'm seeing that specifically with those who are not yet a part of God's family. 
and we seek it in various ways. We, we seek it through sports or through music or through clubs. You know, sometimes we try to find it through military service or through academia or, or community events. It's in the name. Now those ties, hey, I'll level with you. They can be very, very strong, but they're not unbreakable. And neither do they last forever. Time, distance, personal differences, death. Those things start to fray at that tie that binds until eventually that, that tie breaks and there is no more connection. You know, the tie's gone, but the need remains. So what do we do? I, I want you to know there's only one person who can actually say, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you and actually have the power to do it. And that is Jesus Christ. Now, hey, you got us on the fact that sometimes God's people squabble and divide over things we should not. But I want you to know something. That's not forever either. Because by the power of Christ, the petty differences of God's people are going to be put away once and for all, and we will be made one in him. And if you need scripture, I've got it for you. If you want to be a part, and actually one more thing, I've been pretty hard on God's family today and it's been tough. Permit me a moment just to brag on them and I'm saying that specifically to the unsaved crowd. I have seen time and time again when people who are so different from each other, who, who on paper should not have the slightest thing in common, are inexplicably bound together. Only there is an answer for it, and that is because they are bound together through the Holy Spirit of God, received through faith in Jesus Christ. And when you've seen that, and I have been blessed with the opportunity to see that many times over, when you see that, it is an incredible testimony that this is real, that the gospel is real, and that Christ saves. If you want to be a part of that eternally united community, if you want an unbreakable bond, I encourage you to repent from your sin, whatever that might be. You don't have to repent to me, repent to God. Admit that you've sinned and receive complete and total forgiveness for that sin through faith in the atonement made for you by God and through God in Jesus Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Recognize him as the Lord of your life and receive that unbreakable bond and that eternal community. Hey, I love you guys. God's word is tough sometimes, amen? Yeah. But I love you. And God loves you even more. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for this reminder not to get caught up in the trivial. Not to divide ourselves in order to pursue an idol, Lord, but unite in order to pursue you and to fight the good fight, to keep the faith. Lord, you have made us free. Lord, keep us from using our freedom to serve ourselves, but to serve you by loving one another, Lord, even as you have shown us how to love. Cause us to love each other in that very same way. In Jesus' name, amen.